Chapter 64, Crisis Theory and Intervention. Crisis Intervention. Crisis is a temporary state of severe emotional disorganization caused by an event that presents a threat. Everyone experiences crisis. The outcome depends on coping mechanisms and support systems available at the time of the crisis. Treatment is aimed at assisting the client and the family through the, through the stressful situation. Phases of a crisis. Phase one, external precipitating event could be situational, developmental, developmental, cultural, or societal. Phase two, perception of the threat. Increased anxiety, client may cope or resolve the crisis. Phase three, failure of coping, increased disorganization, emergence of physical symptoms, relationship problems. Phase four, mobilization of internal and external resources. Goal is to return the individual to at least a pre-crisis level of functioning. Types of crisis, box 64-1. Maturational crisis relates to developmental stages and associative role changes. Examples include marriage, birth of a child, and retirement. Situational crisis arises from an external source is often unanticipated and is associated with a life event that upsets an individual or a group's psychological equilibrium. Examples include loss of a job or a change in job, a change in financial status, death of a loved one, divorce, abortion, and severe physical or mental illness. Adventitious crisis relates to a crisis of disaster or an event that is not a part of everyday life and is, un and is unplanned and accidental. This type of crisis may result from a natural disaster such as a flood, earthquake, hurricane, fire, or tornado. A national disaster such as war, riots, or acts of terrorism, or a crime of violence such as rape, assault, murder, spousal, or child abuse. Crisis interventions include treatment is immediate. Okay, supportive and directly responsive to current crisis. Intervention provides opportunities for expression and validation of feelings. Connections are made between the meaning of the event and the crisis. Client explores alternative coping mechanisms and tries out new behaviors. Grief. Grief is a natural emotional response to loss of individuals Grief is a natural emotional response to loss that individuals must experience as they attempt to accept it. Grief usually involves moving through a series of stages or tasks to help with, re to help res with resolve. Um, <clears throat> box 64-2, the, the grief response. Stage 1 is shock and disbelief. The individual may have feelings of numbness, difficulties with decision-making, emotional outbursts, denial, and isolation. Stage two is experiencing the loss. If the grieving response is a result of a loss of a loved one, the individual may feel angry at the loved one who died or may feel guilt about their death. Bargaining or depression may also occur in this stage. Stage three is reintegration. The individual begins to reorganize his or her life and accepts the reality of the loss. Depending on the type of loss, feelings associated with grief can include anger, frustration, loneliness, sadness, guilt, regret, or peace. Healing can occur when the pain of the loss has lessened and the survivor has adapted to life without the deceased. The survivor will continue to experience memories of the deceased. Types of grief, normal grief, Physical, emotional, cognitive, or behavioral reactions can occur. The process of which the process of resolution can take months to years. Disenfranchised grief occurs when a loss of experience. Disenfranchised grief occurs when a loss of experience and cannot be acknowledged openly. Oh. When a loss is experienced and cannot be acknowledged openly, <laughs> societal norms do not define the loss as a loss within its traditional definition. Dysfunctional grief occurs 
occurs with prolonged emotional instability and a lack of progression to successful coping with the loss. Children's grief is based on their developmental level. Like, um, from birth to a year, the infant has no concept of death. The infant reacts to the loss of death as the infant reacts to the loss of their mother or caregiver. One or two years, the child may see death as reversible. The grieving response occurs only to the death of the, signif of the significant person in the child's life. The child may scream, withdraw, or become disinterested in the environment. Two to five years, the child may see death as reversible. The child has a sense of loss and is concerned about who will provide care. Regression or aggressive behavior may occur. Five to nine years, the child begins to see death as permanent. The child may feel responsible for the occurrence. The child has difficulty concentrating. Pre-adolescence through adolescence. The adolescent sees death as permanent. The adolescent experiences a strong emotional reaction. The adolescent may regress. Loss. Loss is the absence of something desired or previously thought to be available. Actual loss can be identified by others and can arise in response to or in anticipation of a situation. Perceived loss is experienced by one person and cannot be verified by others. Anticipatory loss is experienced before the loss occurs. Mourning. The outward and social expression of loss may be dictated by cultural and religious beliefs. Bereavement <clears throat> includes the inner feelings and the outward reactions of the survivor, includes grief and mourning. The nurse's role with grief and loss. The nurse's role in the loss and grieving process includes communicating with the client, their family members, and significant other. The nurse must consider the survivor's culture, religion, family structure, individual life experiencing experiences, coping skills and support systems. Um, communication during grief and loss is, you wanna determine how much the client and family wanna know. Determine whether there is a spokesperson for their family. Be aware of cultural and religious beliefs and how they may affect the communication process. Consider personal space issues like eye contact and touch. Obtain an interpreter if necessary. Allow opportunities for informed choices. Assist with decision-making process if asked. Use problem solving to assist with decision-making and avoid interject interjecting personal views or opinions. Encourage expression of feelings, concerns, and fears. Be honest and truthful and let the client and family know that you will not abandon them. Ask the client and family about their expectations and needs. Be a sensitive listener. Sit in silence if necessary and appropriate. Extend touch and hold the client or family member's hand if appropriate. Encourage reminiscing. If you do not know what to do in a particular situation, seek assistance. If you do not know what to say to a client or family member who is talking about death, listen attentively and use therapeutic communication techniques such as open-ended questions or reflection. Acknowledge your own feelings. Let the client and family know the topic of the conversation is a difficult one and that you do not know what to say. Let the client and family member know that the topic of the conversation is a difficult one and that you do not know what to say. Realize that it is acceptable to cry with the client and family during the grieving process. But don't be extra. Step out if you need to. Okay, suicidal behavior. Suicidal clients characteristically have feelings of worthlessness, guilt, and hopelessness that, that are so overwhelming they feel unable to go on with life and feel unit, unit, feel unfit to live. The nurse caring for a depressed patient always considers the possibility of suicide. Individuals at risk, a client with a history of previous suicide attempts. Family history of suicide attempts, adolescents, older adults, um, disabled or terminally ill adults, clients with personality disorders, clients with an organic brain syndrome or dementia, depressed or psychotic clients, substance abusers, 
those who have been consistently bullied or rejected by peers or society um clues will include giving away personal special and prized possessions canceling social engage engagements making out or changing a will taking out or changing insurance policies positive or negative changes in behavior poor appetite sleeping difficulties feelings of hopelessness difficulty concentrating loss of interest in activities client statements that in, indicate an intent to attempt suicide sudden calmness or improvement in a client in a depressed client sudden calmness or improvement in a depressed client client questions about poisons guns or other lethal objects these are suicidal clues um data collection would be for a suicidal client is the plan does the client have a plan what is the plan how lethal is the plan and how likely is death to occur does the client have the means to carry out the plan um, client history of attempts, what suicide attempts occurred in the past, and what were the outcomes, like physiological injuries. Was the client accidentally rescued? Have the, pa have the past attempts and methods been the same, or have methods increased in lethality? Um, psychosocial, is the client alone or alienated from others? Is hostility or depression present? Do hallucinations exist? Is substance abuse present? Has the client had any recent losses or physical illnesses? Has the client had any environmental or lifestyle changes? So the interventions would be to assess for suicidal intent or ideation and initiate suicide precautions. Remove harmful objects. Do not leave the client alone. Provide a non-judgmental, a caring attitude. Develop a contract per psychiatrist pres prescription and agency procedures that is written dated and signed and that indicates alternative behaviors at time of suicidal thoughts encourage the client to talk about feelings and identify positive aspects about self encourage active participation in own care keep the client active by assigning achievable tasks check that visitors do not leave harmful objects in the room identify support systems do not allow the client to leave the unit unless accompanied by a staff member continue to assess the client's suicide potential the most important thing to do is to provide one-on-one -on -one supervision at all times for the client at risk for suicide. Abusive behaviors. Anger. A feeling of annoyance that may be displaced onto an object or a person. It's used to avoid anxiety and gives a feeling of power in situations in which the person feels out of control. Aggression can be harmful and destructive when not controlled. Violence is a physical force that is threatening to the safety of self and others. Data collection is history of violence or self-harm, poor impulse control, and low tolerance of frustration. Defiance and argumentativeness, raising of voice, making verbal threats, pacing and agitation, muscle rigidity, flushed face, glaring at others. Interventions maintain safety. Use a calm approach and communicate with a calm, clear tone of voice. Be assertive but not aggressive and avoid verbal struggles. Maintain a large personal space and use a non-aggressive posture. Listen actively and acknowledge the client's anger. Determine what the client considers to be his or her need. Provide the client with clear options that deal with the client's behavior, set limits on behavior, and make the client aware of the consequences of anger and violence. Discuss the use of restraints or seclusions if the client is unable to control angry behavior that may lead to violence. Assist the client with problem solving and decision making regarding the options. Restraints, security devices, and seclusions. Physical restraints, any manual method of mechanical device, any manual method or mechanical device, material or equipment that inhibits free movements. Seclusion. A process in which a client is placed alone in a specifically, specially designed room for protection and close supervision. Chemical restraints. Medication is given for the specific purpose of inhibiting a specific behavior or movement and that have an effect on the client's ability to relate to the environment. 
Use of restraints and seclusions. Restraints and seclusions should never be used as punishment or for the convenience of the healthcare staff. Restraints and seclusion are used when others, when behavior is physically harmful to the client or others, and when alternative of or less restrictive measures are insufficient in protecting the client or others from harm. The nurse. Mm -mm. The nurse must document the behavior leading to the use of the restraints or seclusion. Restraints and seclusion are used when the client anticipates that a controlled environment would be helpful and requests seclusion. In, a, in an emergency, the qualified nurse may place a client in restraints or seclusion and obtain a written or verbal prescription as soon as possible thereafter. Within one hour of the initiation of restraints or seclusion, the, psych the psychiatrist must make face-to-face -face assessments an evaluation of the client and must continuously reevaluate the client need for continued restraint or seclusion. While in restraints or seclusion, the client must be protected from all sources of harm by having the one-on-one -on -one supervision with staff member within arm's reach of the client. The client is restrained the client in restraints or seclusion needs constant one-on-one -on -one supervision. Physical safety and comfort needs must be assessed every 15 to 30 minutes, and these observations are also documented, such as food, fluids, bathroom needs, range of motion exercises, and ambulation. The nurse must always follow agency procedures and policies regarding the use of restraints and must also be familiar with their use for the older client and juveniles. Bullying. Bullying is the abuse of power by an individual on another through repeated aggressive acts. It most often occurs in children and in high school or college environments, but can also occur in the workplace or other environments. The bully feels power from sources such as physical strength, maturity, a higher status within a peer group, from knowing the victim's weaknesses, or from support of others. Bullying can occur in the form of physical form, relational aggression, isolation, exclusion, and verbal harm, such as slander, rumors, or threats. It is both intentionally cruel and unprovoked. Cyberbullying is also a form of bullying and occurs in the form of the internet messages on social media networks, text messages, emails, photos being posted, and rumors. The bullied person is re repeatedly experiencing negative actions from the bullies. These bully acts can lead to depression, low self-esteem, humiliation, isolation, and social withdrawal in the victim. It could result in suicide and murder. The nurse's responsibility is to observe for signs of bullying and to educate teachers, school administrators, and parents about bullying behaviors and signs that it may be occurring. Family violence. <clears throat> um, the cycle of violence is serious battering phase, which includes the victim may try to cover up the injury or may look for help. The tension becomes unbearable. The victim may provoke an incident to to get to get it over with this is serious battering incident the honeymoon phase is the abuser con contrite sorry makes promises to change loving behavior such as bringing gifts and flowers and doing special things for the victim the victim is trusting hoping for change wants to believe partners promises then that goes to a tension building phase when the abuser is edgy, has minor explosions, may become verbally abusive, minor hitting, slapping, and other incidents begin. Victim feels tense and afraid, like walking on eggs oh, walking on eggshells, feels helpless, becomes compliant, and accepts blame in tension building phase of the cycle of violence and then it goes into the serious battering phase. It's a cycle. Serious battering phase being the worst. Okay. The violence begins with threats or verbal or physical minor assaults. Tension bullying. Tension building. And the victim attempts to comply with the request of the abuser. The abuser loses control and becomes destructive and harmful. Acute battering while the victim attempts to protect him, himself or herself. After the battering, the abuser then becomes loving and attempts to make peace, calmness, and a diffusion of tension. 
The abuser justifies that violence is normal and the victim is responsible for the abuse. Outsiders are usually not aware of what is happening in the family. Family members are isolated socially and lack autonomy and trust among another. Caring and intimacy in the family are absent. Family members expect other members of the family to meet their needs, but none are able to do so. The abuser threatens to abandon the family. Types of violence, box 647. Physical violence, infliction of physical pain or bodily harm, sexual violence, any form of sexual contact without consent, emotional violence, infliction of mental anguish, physical neglect, failure to provide health care to prevent or treat physical or emotional illnesses, developmental neglect, failure to provide physical and cognitive stimulation needed to prevent development, developmental de deficits, uh, educational neglect, depriving a child of education, and economic exploitation, illegal or improper exploitation of money, funds, or other resources for one person's gain. One personal gain. Okay, that's the types of violence. The vulnerable, pers the vulnerable person. The vulnerable person is the one in the family unit against whom violence is perpetrated. Those most vulnerable are children and older adults. The perpetrator of violence and the person targeted by the violence can be male or female. Battering is a crime. Characteristics of abusers. Impaired self-esteem, strong dependency needs, narcissistic and suspicious, history of abuse during childhood, perceive victims as their property and believe that they are entitled to abuse them. Characteristics of victims. Victims feel trapped, dependent, helpless, and powerless. Victims of abuse may become depressed as they are trapped in the abuser's power and control cycle. As the victim's self-esteem becomes diminished with chronic abuse, they may blame themselves for the violence and be unable to see a, a way out of the situation. Interventions report suspected or actual cases of child or adult abuse to appropriate authorities. Follow state and agency guidelines. Check for evidence of physical injuries. Ensure privacy and confidentiality during data collection and provide a non-judgmental and empathetic approach to foster trust. Reassure the victim that he or she has not done anything wrong. Uh, data question. Has anyone ever touched you in a way that made you feel uncomfortable? Question, these are the questions you would need to ask. Is anyone hurting you now? How do you and your partner deal with anger or disagreement? Has your partner ever hit you? Have you ever been threatened by blank? Does your partner prevent you from seeing family or friends? Does your partner ever use the children to manipulate you? Did or does anyone in your family deal with anger by hitting? Whom do you play with most often? Is there anyone you do not like playing with? Are there games you do not like playing? Those are the questions you need to be asking. <clears throat> Assist the victim with developing self-protective abilities and other problem-solving abil abilities. Even if, the even if the victim is not ready to leave the situation, encourage the victim to develop a specific safety plan, a fast escape if the violence resumes, and the best place to obtain help, like hotlines, safe houses, and shelters. An abused person is usually reluctant to call the police. Assess the suicidal potential of the victim. Assess the potential for homicide. Check for the use of drugs and alcohol. Determine family coping patterns and support systems. Provide support and assistance with coping by contracting, contacting the legal system. Assist in resolving family dysfunction with prescribed therapies. Encourage individual therapy as prescribed. For the victim that promotes coping with trauma and prevents further psychological conflict. Individual therapy that focuses on preventing violent behavior and repairing relationships is encouraged for abusers. Encourage psychotherapy, counseling, group therapy, and support groups as, as prescribed to assist family members with developing coping strategies. Assist the family with accessing community and personal resources. Maintain accurate and thorough medical health records. Child 
abduction. Child abduction is the kidnapping of a child or infant by an older person. Occurrences, a stranger may kidnap a child for criminal or mischievous purposes. A stranger may kidnap a child or infant to bring up him or her as that person's own child. A parent removes or retains a child from the other parent's care, often in the course of of or after divorce proceedings. Because of the increased independence that occurs in the preschool age children, parents are less able to provide the constant protection they once did when a child reaches this age. Interventions that ensure protection, including teaching the child, are necessary. Interventions. Instruct the parent to teach their child basic guidelines about personal safety that include the following. Do not go anywhere alone. Always tell an adult where he or she is going and when she or he will return. Say no if she feels uncomfortable with the situation. Do not talk to strangers or get into cars. Do not help anyone look for a lost dog, cat, and do not accept candy from a stranger. If lost in a store, do not wander around looking for the parent. Go at once to a clerk or guard. Children need to learn their full name, address, and parent's name. Watch for post-traumatic stress disorder in any child who has experienced an abduction. Child abuse. Description. Abuse is the non-accidental physical injury or non-accidental act of omission of care by a parent or person responsible for a child. Abuse compromises neglect and physical, sexual, and emotional maltreatment. Neglect can be in a form of physical or emotional neglect and involves the deprivation of the basic needs, supervision, medical care, or education and failure to meet a child's needs for attention and affection. Sexual abuse can involve incest, molestation, exhibit exhibitionism, pornography, prostitution, or pedophilia. Findings associated with sexual abuse may not be easily apparent in a child. Shaken baby syndrome is caused by the violent shaking of an infant and results in intracranial, usually subdural hemorrhage, trauma. This can lead to cerebral edema and death. Data collection 64.9. Neglect, inadequate weight gain, poor hygiene, consistent hunger, and inconsistent school attendance, constant fatigue, reports of lack of child supervision, and delinquency. Physical abuse, unexplained bruises, burns or fractures, bald spots on the scalp, apprehension child, apprehensive child, extreme aggressiveness or withdrawal, fear of parents, lack of crying, older infant, toddler, or young preschool child when approached by a stranger, um, spiral fractures without history of trimer from a sports injury, emotional abuse, speech disorders, habit disorders such as sucking, biting, and rocking, psychoneurotic reactions, learning disorders, suicide attempts. Sexual abuse include difficulty walking or sitting, torn, stained, or bloody underclothing, pain, swelling, or itching of genitals, bruises, bleeding, or lacerations in genital or anal area, unwillingness to change clothes or unwillingness to participate in gym activities, poor peer relations. Shaken baby syndrome. External signs of trauma are usually absent. Ophthalmoscopic examination reveals retinal hemorrhage, full bulging fontanelles, and head circumference greater than expected. Hmm. Support the child during a thorough physical assessment. Check for injuries. If shaken baby syndrome is suspected, monitor the infant for a decrease in level of consciousness, which can indicate increased intracranial pressure. Report a case of suspected abuse. Nurses are legally required to report all cases of suspected child abuse to the appropriate local or state agency. Place the child in an environment that is safe, preventing further injury. Document information related to the suspected abuse in an objective manner. Assist with assessing the parent's strengths and weaknesses, normal coping mechanisms, and presence of ab- or absence of a support system. Assist the family with identifying stressors, support systems, and resources. Refer the family to appropriate support groups. Nurses are legally required to report all cases of suspected child abuse to the appropriate local or state agency. Latchkey children. 
Children who do not have adult supervision before or after school hours, they are left to care for themselves during these times. Occurs when children are members of a single parent family or when both parents work and need to leave the home before children are brought to school. This situation induces a stress-provoking environment for children and places them at risk for unsafe situation, injury, and delinquent behavior. Interventions identify the latchkey child Encourage the patient to encourage the parent to teach the child about self care and self help skills. Assist the parent with identifying possible alternatives to leaving the child alone. Inform the parent about available community resources such as after school programs for children. Abuse of the older adult. Abuse of an older adult involves physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, neglect, and economic exploitation. Older adults at most risk include individuals who are dependent because of illness, immobility, or altered mental status. Factors that contribute to abuse and neglect include long-standing family violence, caregiver stress, and the older adults' increasing dependence on others. Victims may attempt to dismiss injuries as accidental, and abusers may prevent victims from receiving proper medical care to avoid discovery. Victims are often isolated socially by their abusers. Data collection. Physical abuse, sprains, dislocations or fractures, abrasions, bruises, or lacerations, pressure sores, puncture wounds, burns, skin tears, sexual abuse, torn or sustained underclothing, discomfort or bleeding in the genital area, difficulty walking or sitting, unexplained genital infections or diseases, emotional abuse, confusion, Fearful and agitated, change in appetite and weight, withdrawn and loss of interest in self and social activities. Neglect, disheveled appearance, dress inadequately or inappropriately, dehydration and malnutrition, lacking physical needs such as glasses, hearing aids, and dentures, signs of medication overdose, uh, economic exploitation, inability to pay bills, and fearful when discussing finances. Confused and inaccurate or no knowledge of finances interventions assess and treat the wounds remove the victim from immediate danger adhere to mandatory abuse reporting laws notify the caseworker of the family situation document the occurrence findings actions taken and the victim's response when a victim is abused the priority is to assess and treat any physical injuries. The nurse stays with the victim and provides comfort and support. After physical injuries are treated, the nurse ensures that the client is safe and is removed from the threatening environment. The nurse assists the registered nurse with making appropriate contacts. Elder abuse needs to be reported, so the nurse would adhere to mandatory abuse reporting laws of the state. The nurse also contacts the caseworker of the family situation so that the incident is reported and follow up with the family can occur. If there is no caseworker, the nurse contacts social services <clears throat> or the appropriate service to initiate this process. Finally, the nurse documents the occurrence, findings, and actions taken in the victim's response. Rape and sexual assault. Rape, sexual assault, is engaging another person in a sexual act and or sexual intercourse through the use of force and without the consent of the sexual partner. The victim is not required by law to report rape or assault. Often, the victim is blamed by others and receives no support from significant others. Acquaintance rape involves someone known to the victim. Statutory rape is the act of sexual intercourse with a person under the age of the legal consent, even if the minor consents. Marital rape is the belief that marriage bestows rights to sex whenever wanted and without consent of the partner contributes to the occurrence of marital rape. Victims of marital rape describe being forced to perform acts they did not wish to perform and being physically abused during sex. Data collection. <laughs> Terrible. Female client. Obtain the date of the last menstrual period. Determine the form of birth control used in the last act of intercourse before rape. Determine the duration of intercourse, orifice violated, and whether penile penetration occurred. Determine the use of a condom by the perpetrator. 
Shame, embarrassment, and humiliation. Anger and revenge. Fear of telling others for fear of not being believed. It is important to note that males may be sexually abused both as children and as adults and are the usual targeted victim of pedophiles. Males may have more difficulty with disclosing their abuse. Rape trauma syndrome. Sleep disturbances and nightmares, loss of appetite, fears, anxiety, phobias, and suspicion, decrease in activities and motivation, disruptions in relationships with partner, family, and friends, self-blame, guilt, and shame, lowered self-esteem and feelings of worthlessness, somatic complaints. See chapter 52 for information on post-traumatic stress disorder. Wow. Interventions. Perform data collection in a quiet, private area. Stay with the victim. Assess the victim's stress level before performing treatments and procedures. Victims should not shower, bathe, douche, female, or change clothing until examination is performed. Ensure that written consent is obtained for the examination. Photographs, lab tests, release of information in laboratory samples. Assist with the family assist with the female pelvic examination and, and obtain specimens to detect semen the pelvic examination may trigger a flashback of the attack a shower and fresh clothing should be made available to the client after the examination preserve any evidence treat physical injuries and provides client safety document all events in the event in the care of the victim mm. I gotta stop thinking. <laughs> Reinforce to the victim that surviving the assault is most important. If the victim survived the rape, he or she did exactly what was necessary to stay alive. Refer the victim to crisis intervention and support groups. Okay, that's the, that's the end of that. Um, I'm going to start the questions on the next video.